Hi, today I'm going to have a close look at Frownland by Captain Beefheart and his magic band from the 1969 album Trout Mask Replica. <laughs> Stuck. I cannot go back to your frown land My spirit's made up of the ocean and the sky And the sun and the moon and all I can see so this is a, a legendary album that has been enormously discussed and talked about and written about over the years. And one thing that's often struck me is that critics attempting to write about this album have tended to rely rather excessively, in my view, on emotional descriptors of what their experience of listening to it is, which doesn't always help us to get a handle on exactly what is going on in one of these songs from a musical or analytical perspective. So I'm going to try to do that, and I'm going to look at it using precise technical analytical terminology so that we really get a, a sense of what this thing is exactly. So before we launch into that, I'd like to say that if you are a music student and you haven't sat down and listened to this entire record, which is 80 minutes long, at least four times, then your musical education is woefully incomplete. Every every composer should know this record. Every uh, everyone interested seriously in music needs to know it because it's a it's just an amazing amazing achievement on all sorts of levels. And you know, I'm frankly not very interested in whether people like it or not. That's not really the point. The point is to try to come to terms with what the thing is and what is it about it that is so innovative and and exciting. It's, it's been an incredibly influential album. Uh, many people have, have claimed it as, as being a, an essential record. Um, and lots of people actually, frankly, hate it and can't stand it. So it, it's, it's been very polarizing. But it is a major artistic statement. It's a very, very important record. And I think that even if one doesn't necessarily like it, it's important to know what it is and how it was made. So to begin with, here are some basic elements about the record. So Frownland is the opening track from the album, and it is a certainly a, a remarkably audacious way to start off a record because it is by far the most complex thing on the whole record, as far as I'm concerned. And I mean, there are a lot of very complex pieces on this. It's it's a double set, and it's uh, it's it's a very uh, it's a very lengthy and imposing artistic statement, but this is this is the most complex one, Frownland, as far as I'm concerned. It's a track that's less than two minutes long. It's one minute and 40 seconds, to be precise. Uh, the amount of material that it contains is actually quite astonishing when you, you have a close look at it. So this record was recorded in 1969 by a lineup that was essentially a quintet. So the core of it is Don Van Vliet, alias Captain Beefheart, on vocals, and he's also the main composer of the record and wrote all the lyrics. Then you have Bill Harkle Road on first guitar, Jeff Cotton on second guitar, Mark Boston on bass guitar, and John French on the drums. All of these performers were given stage names by Beefheart, which appeared on the record sleeve. As far as the sound of the album goes, one of the things that, that strikes a listener at first hearing is it's got a certain harshness to it. So unfortunately the record is not particularly well mixed. The instruments tend to be clustered together in, in a, a rather narrow frequency band. It's not easy to pull them apart. Uh, the bass is somewhat muddy. Uh, it's not a very clean sounding recording, but that doesn't particularly impede my musical enjoyment of it. And in fact, I think one of the qualities that the, that the band and that Captain Beefheart were going for is a certain abrasiveness, a certain harshness. And one of the ways that they achieved this result is that the electric guitars are played with distortion and also with, with steel picks, which is a somewhat unusual thing to do. So when you play a guitar with a pick, and especially with a steel pick, you increase the amount of noise in the attack, essentially. You, you complexify the sound of the instrument. And the other thing that was done is the drum kit was prepared in the same sort of sense as a, as a prepared piano with bits of cardboard. So from what I gather, this originally came about because the band was rehearsing in a house in Woodland Hills, California, and they had neighbors that were just sort of fed up with all the noise. And so the drummer decided to mute his drums with pieces of cardboard, and this sort of sonic technique was carried over into the recording sessions. And one of the interesting things about this is that when you have, for example, a piece of cardboard 
between the symbols of a hi-hat or placed on drum heads, you get a somewhat chaotic result sonically because the, the, the pieces of, of cardboard are not going to interact with the drumsticks and the drum heads and the cymbals in precisely the same way each time the drum is attacked. So it, it again provides a, a rather distorted and complex sound. So all of these things go towards the overall timbral qualities of this record, which are certainly remarkable. One final point is that the record was composed in a rather unique way. Don Van Vliet was not a trained musician, he couldn't read or write music, and he couldn't even really play piano all that well, but he actually wrote all of these pieces on a piano, and according to his own claim, he did so in eight and a half hours. Well, that claim is actually completely false. But what, what actually happened is he would sit down at the piano for very lengthy sessions and write these pieces or fragments of pieces which were then transcribed by the drummer, by John French, who would be sitting next to him. And then once these bits of music were transcribed, they would be then taught to the other performers in the group. And eventually they would be massaged into, into songs. So this was a very lengthy and time-consuming process, and the album took the better part of a year to compose, to rehearse, and to record. So it's worth pointing out that there was an extraordinary degree of investment and dedication on the part of everyone involved, and particularly the performers. And this album certainly would not be anything close to what it is had Captain Beefheart not had the extraordinary luck of being surrounded by some absolutely remarkable young performers. So in terms of the atmosphere in which this, this album was made, it was highly fractious. Captain Beefheart was approximately 10 years older than the, than the performers who were all about 19 or 20 years old. And he had a rather domineering, tyrannical personality. And part of the only way that this whole thing could be made to work was that he was rather domineering and and imposed his his will on these performers in a somewhat ruthless manner. They agreed to continue because of the extraordinary nature of the music and of the fact that they sensed that they were involved in something of tremendous artistic importance, but it was by no means a walk in the park uh, rehearsing and learning all of these pieces. So let's have a look at the poem, the text for this song. I'm going to start off by reading it and then we'll have a look at some of the technical features of the text. My smile is stuck, I cannot go back to your frown land. My spirit's made up of the ocean, and the sky, and the moon, and all my eye can see. I cannot go back to your land of gloom, where black jagged shadows remind me of the coming of your doom. I want my own land. Take my hand and come with me. It's not too late for you, it's not too late for me, to find my homeland. Where a man can stand by another man without an ego flying, with no man lying, and no one dying by an earthly hand. Let the devils burn and the beggar learn, and the little girls that live in those old worlds take my kind hand. My smile is stuck. I cannot go back to your frown land. I cannot go back to your frown land. So we talked earlier about the fact that the album has a certain abrasiveness to it, and I think this is something that's signaled actually immediately in the title of the album, which is a sort of throaty jumble of plosives and consonants, and it's sort of spiky and, and arrhythmic, and it's a remarkable sounding album title. So some of the sonic aspects of the music itself are present in the poetry in a, in a rather amazing manner. So let's have a look at the lyrical content here. So the first thing I would say is that this is essentially a, a first-person lyric narrative piece. So we have the expression of a utopian vision, which is something that's in keeping certainly with the predominant ethos of the 1960s. There's a concern here with ethics and with morality, and the piece as a whole is, is quite striking in the context of the album because this is a, a very difficult lesson for a lot of people, but it starts off with an ode to cheerfulness. So that's a remarkable thing for Don Van Vliet to have done. From a structural point of view, this is basically free verse. There's no particular metrical pattern to it, although it does very haphazardly use things such as rhymes and syntactical parallelism. So we do have rhyming words like doom and gloom. Moon also rhymes with gloom and doom. We have fly-in, lion, and so on. And then you have you have very similar syntactical structures such as it's not too late for you, it's not too late for me, or without an ego flying with no man lion. So there are these there are these haphazardly used 
structural devices. And then you also have a repeat of the opening lines at the end. So for an album that is very preoccupied with notions of untrammeled freedom, this is a kind of unusual thing. So you do have actually a nod to a very classical poetic device, which is the return of the opening lines at the end of the poem. You'll also notice that Don Van Vliet uses idiosyncratic spelling throughout, so it's sort of an attempt to, to capture phonetically the qualities of actual demotic uh, vernacular speech through the use of spelling, such as your instead of your, and the abbreviated T apostrophe instead of two. The poem is told from the vantage point of a lyrical self who is somewhat haughtily proclaiming that it's not necessary to be mired in sort of doom and gloom, that he wants his own land where he can smile and where it's cheerful, there's no fighting, there are no egos, and so on. From a, a, a high up position, sort of looking almost downwardly on, on the people who are sort of stuck in the, in the mire of the everyday world and imploring them to come with him to another land. So it's, it's a poem that's an invitation. It's an invitation that's, that starts off the record and it's an invitation to a kind of a humanistic philosophy and a rather positive vision of what humanity could be. The final thing I'll say about it is that the, the author's subjective voice is obviously extremely present here, and in a 23-line poem we have no fewer than 16 first-person pronouns, so it's clear that the author has a certain degree of ego. So in order to analyze a piece like this, we have to have some sort of analytical tools, and we need to be able to parse it. So what I'd like to do is we'll start off by looking at its general features, and then I will have a look at the, the score of the piece. Well, there is no score, but I've actually made a, a transcription of the main material that we hear in Frownland, and that's going to help me to sort of indicate what, what the basic elements are. So to start things off, the instrumentation of the record is actually remarkably similar to a Baroque trio sonata in the sense that we have two melodic instruments of basically equal importance, and that's a remarkable thing for, um, for a rock record in the sense that normally you have a lead guitar that takes the solos and you have a rhythm guitar that sort of is more in the background. And in this record, there is absolutely no foreground-background distinction. Everything is sort of shifted ahead to the sort of foreground. So the two guitars are of equal importance throughout. They both play material of, of very similar qualities. The bass guitar also is by no means relegated to a function of grounding the harmony. In fact, that's the last thing the bass does here. The bass is uh, an absolutely independent instrument in the same sense as the guitars and plays material that is pretty much as complex. The other thing that's remarkable about the bass playing on this record is that the bassist regularly plays chords, which is something that just never happens in rock music. So, so the, the two guitars and the bass are more or less of equal importance. And then finally you have the drums. And the drums are, are, are extraordinarily virtuosic on this record. I mean, it's, it's some of the most astonishing virtuosic, inventive drumming I've ever heard in my life. Um, the, the drummer sometimes locks in with the guitars, sometimes with the bass, sometimes both of them simultaneously, so it's not easy to parse exactly what's happening in the drum parts, uh, particularly given the fact that there's a lot of variation on, on basic patterns. Nevertheless, uh, similar to, to a Baroque Trio Sonata, we do have these two melodic instruments and a sort of accompanimental subgrouping of, of, uh, of drums and bass. The piece can be roughly divided into sections. They're not exactly sections, they're sort of too short for that, but they are segments in any case that have more or less homogeneous features. So I'm going to have a look at that in a second. For me, this piece can be divided into seven sections, which is actually quite a lot given the fact that it's only a minute and 40 seconds long. I'd like to dispel some very persistent myths before we start getting into detail in terms of how the, the, the song is actually constructed. So the first is that it's very often described as being atonal or arrhythmic or completely improvised. Well, none of these things is true in the slightest. So when you pull apart the music, you quickly see that most of the phrases and most of the melodies on the record are in fact uh, diatonic. They're not atonal by any stretch of the imagination. What makes them rather complex is the fact that often you have multiple tonalities that are superimposed. 
but they are not by any means properly atonal. It's often being said that this music is arrhythmic, that the rhythms are, are sort of chaotic, that they don't repeat, that there's no patterns in this music. Nothing could be farther from the truth. This record is absolutely full of patterns. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, what is, again, unusual is the fact that you do have asynchronous patterns. So in other words, you have patterns that don't last the same amount of time, but that repeat independently. So you'll have one pattern continuing in one speed and then a, a different pattern going on at a different speed. So basically you have polyrhythms and polytonality. None of this is improvised. In fact, it was, it was the fruit of an enormous amount of labor, as I mentioned earlier. So we can do away forever with the contention that this music is somehow uh, chaotically performed, that it's, it's sort of got no deliberateness about how it was put together. That's actually not true. And if you want proof that the music is not chaotic, all you have to do is listen to uh, an absolutely remarkable CD set that was put out a number of years ago, which is this. It's called Grow Fins. And on the third disc of that set, you have recordings of the pieces, alternate recordings of the pieces, before the band actually went into a studio, and without the vocal parts. So it allows you just to hear the instrumental tracks, and they are substantially identical to what's on the studio recording. So they're not identical. I mean, they're not exactly the same, because there is a certain degree of looseness to the way the pieces are actually uh, performed, in the sense that I mean, it's not, it's not primarily music that is written down in the form of a score. It's music that's meant to be played live and meant to be given a certain degree of energy in the performance. So, no, it's not absolutely identical from one version to another, but the, the basic material is the same, and the structures are the same, and it's act actually quite amazing um, the fidelity with which the band was able to reproduce these pieces on multiple occasions. So given their given their extreme complexity. What Van Vliet wanted was a quality of a certain uh, organic freeness to the way the material came together. He wanted to get away as far as possible from these sort of very basic, primitive, one, two, three, four beat patterns of rock music and into something that would be more lively, uh, organic, and complex. So I've parsed this one minute, 40 second song into what I call seven blocks. So each block is made up of basically homogeneous uh, fragments and, and materials that are, generally speaking, repeated. So these, these repeating phrases I've referred to as cells, and in my analysis of this record I've identified a total of 21 separate rhythmic and sort of pitch cells. So again, that's a very, very large amount of material for such a short song. So some of these cells actually return later on in the piece. So there is repetition on multiple levels in this record. So you have these rhythmical and, and pitch cells that are repeated immediately, sort of three or four times before the performer will go on to something else. But then later on in the piece, he might return to the same material again sometimes in a varied presentation, sometimes pretty much identically. So I've parsed this down into blocks and cells. So let's have a look at what these are. So in this first part of the piece, we have essentially a very complex polyrhythm in the sense that the first guitar and the bass guitar are both playing the same seven beat pattern four times. And then guitar two plays a five beat pattern that roughly coincides with the duration of the seven beat pattern. So in other words, the, the second guitar is playing five beats in the time of seven. So that's really technically hard to do. Um, and they really pull it off amazingly well. And again, you, all you have to do is listen to the alternate takes of these songs to realize that they were perfectly capable of doing this in a consistent manner. So the drums are roughly playing together with cell one, so this, this repeating seven beat phrase, although they're not completely synchronous with the guitar and the bass guitar. So there is uh, a rather remarkable rhythmic vitality and diversity within this initial block, which lasts all of 12 seconds. So that's the amount of time you have to sort of pull apart this piece and, and, and figure out what's going on in the, in the sort of introductory segment of the song. So what I'd suggest is that we, we pull this apart and just listen to the separate phrases here, the separate cells. So I've made a transcription of cell 1. So again, this is 
not going to have the same vitality and the same extraordinary quality as what's on the record, but it'll give you a, a rough idea of what the music is made up of. So let's just listen to the first guitar and the bass guitar. We'll just listen to their material separated out from the rest. Okay, so now let's listen to what the second guitar is playing. And finally, let's put everything together. So we're going to hear the two guitars plus the bass guitar playing their material together. So this is, this is a, a pattern of 5 against 7. Okay, and finally, let's refer back to the original recording. So this is what the first 12 or so seconds of the piece sounds like. My smile is stuck. I cannot go back to your frown land. Right, so one thing that is sort of very interesting about this is that the music is in fact as far from atonal as you could possibly imagine. In fact, the, the three melodic instruments are all playing in C major. And the, the bass here, again, does not provide the function of, of rooting the harmony, and in fact avoids playing, playing the root at all times. And instead, we have the, the basses, generally speaking, playing the fifth and the third. But nevertheless, all these instruments are playing in C major. So in the second block, things get a little bit more complex from a tonal perspective. So we've shifted into A minor. We're no longer in C. Uh, the two guitars are playing the same rhythmic pattern here. So I would say that, generally speaking, in terms of the way this album is put together, the actual pitch content of these phrases is not always hugely important. I would say that the rhythmic patterns are more important. But nevertheless, let's have a look at what's going on. So we have this a little A minor lick here, it's about four beats long, and we've shifted not only into A minor, but we've also shifted into a ternary beat pattern. So we're in a triplet rhythm as opposed to a, a pattern of straight eighths. Now the bass guitar here is doing something that's actually completely unrelated harmonically and rhythmically to what's going on in the guitars. So the bass guitar material here is actually uh, harmonically quite ambiguous because we have the outline of F sharp and then F natural and then E. So we have a sort of descending uh, chromatic fragment here. I, I suppose this little fragment could be assimilated into a tonality in F major, although not terribly easily or convincingly. But that's basically what's going on here. So at a certain point, the first guitar breaks off from what the second guitar and bass guitar are doing into a solo. And this solo is in C. Um, it's not clear if it's in C major or C minor because we have both E flat and E natural. Uh, that appear in this phrase at different points. My spirit's made up of the ocean and the sky and the sun in the moon. In the third block, we have yet another tonal shift. The first guitar suddenly moves into B flat major, which is a key that is quite unrelated to C major, which is where we started out. And the second guitar plays this sort of bluesy riff in a different tempo. So guitar one continues in what I gather is the main tempo of the piece, which is approximately uh, quarter equals 132, which is a very, very fast tempo. Uh, guitar two here seems to be moving at approximately quarter equals 80, and it's playing this lick that's sort of in, in G major. And the bass guitar here starts a new pattern, cell number 7, which actually recurs later on in the piece, which is in C minor. So it's this sort of um, slightly uh, swung or shuffle type rhythm with these sort of syncopations. So while all of this is going on, again the first guitar breaks off and does a solo, which this time is basically in, in F major. I cannot go back to your land of gloom where black jagged shadows. In the fourth block, the key of G major seems to be 
becoming the, the main key of the piece by this point. We notice that a lot of the material is sort of centering around that key. Um, we have G major in the first guitar part, which is playing a very short little four beat phrase. And in the second guitar, we also have a phrase in G major. It's a somewhat longer phrase. It's very, it's very bluesy, and it's got again these sort of irregular, uh, sort of shuffle rhythms throughout. So let's just have a listen to uh, cell number nine here. So that's actually a fairly conventional sounding little melodic phrase. However, in the bass guitar, we have something completely different. So the bassist is playing these rapid triplets in F major, and these triplets also contain thirds, so these sort of uh, third chords, and that's, again, very, very, very unusual to hear that in a rock song. And then after repeating that phrase a number of times, the bassist then moves off into E minor and plays a completely different phrase. I want my So in the fifth block, guitar one shifts into E minor, and guitar two is playing in what looks like G major, and they're both playing at the same time in the same rhythm. So again, guitar one and two here fuse into a single rhythmical unit, and the bass guitar is playing a completely different uh, rhythmical unit that's four beats long, whereas the guitars are playing an eight-beat phrase. And again, the, the tempi of these two different phrases is not the same. So the bass guitar here, once again, is, is tonally rather ambiguous. Uh, it describes a five-note mode of F-sharp, G, A, B-flat, and C, which is not easy to assimilate into any particular key, although it could be said to center around G minor, possibly. And the other remarkable thing about this is that we have uh, a very prominent use of the notes F-sharp and C in the bass part. So the, the bass is actually playing um, a tritone chord of C and F sharp again, so that's, a, that's just a sonority that you never ever hear in rock music. Too late for me to find my home. Where man can stand by another man without an ego flying. Sixth block, the guitars are, are mostly in G major throughout. The first guitar starts doing some rather virtuosic playing towards the second part of this of this block in the sense that we have a sort of tremolando figure that starts to come in for the first time. We've never had anything like that in the piece up to this point. The second guitar brings back cell 9, which we heard earlier, which was that sort of bluesy, sort of shuffly kind of rhythm, and then immediately varies it. So after playing it a first time in a slightly truncated version, because actually the initial reprise of, of cell number 9 is shorter than the initial statement of it, and then it's followed by this reprise, which is sort of varied, and it uses smaller rhythmical figures, so we have 16th notes instead of the predominant 8th uh, note rhythm that we'd heard previously. So it's, a, it's an ornamented version of the same thing. The bass guitar here is playing chords yet again in the lowest register. There's actually an error in my transcription. The, the second chord there is not EG, uh, which is actually technically impossible to play on a normally tuned bass. But anyway, the, the basic idea is that the bassist is playing on the third and fourth strings, playing double stops, and again it's a four beat phrase and a completely unrelated uh, tempo to what the others are doing. And then after a number of repetitions of this cell, which I've called cell 16, we return to cell 7, which is the C minor repeating swing phrase that we heard earlier. So here we have quite a jumble of different tonalities. We have the guitars that are more or less in G. We have the, the bass guitar, which is to the extent that you can even perceive the pitches and what it's playing uh, in such a low register, we have something essentially in E minor, and then followed by C minor in the bass. So it's still very complex, but there is this coalescing around a central key of G. Lying, 
So the piece ends with a remarkable cadential gesture. The guitars remain initially in, in G major, but what happens is that we have we have these new figures, so cells 18 and 19, but once they've been stated a few times, the guitars then bring them up an octave and play them faster and faster and with more and more sort of complex ornamentation and variation. And so that is uh, a cadential gesture in the sense that it, it brings us quite breathlessly to the apex of complexity and speed also of the song. And while all of this is going on, the bass initially continues with cell number seven and then introduces a new figure which is more or less in C major towards the end of the piece. Right, so we get this sort of maniacal ending of the piece where everyone is sort of playing faster and faster and we have again these different superimposed keys, but the piece by this point is, is more or less grounded in G, and what's interesting about that is, we'll recall that we started out in C major, and we seem to have ended in G, so it's as though there were a kind of tonic to dominant progression over the course of the 1 minute and 40 seconds of this piece. Just to resume, 21 different fragments, all of different length, and some of them played in, in different conflicting tempi, all of them in different keys as well. I mean, it's, it's a remar remarkable recipe for a rock song, it's absolutely unique. And when you do pull this thing apart, you realize that it was put together with great skill by the performers. And once you've sort of internalized what these essential components are, and you have a kind of mental roadmap of the piece, it actually becomes a lot easier to listen to and to understand what's going on in it. So remember, this is just one piece on a double album, and the whole record is absolutely amazing and certainly worth listening to very closely. So this will give you an idea of some of the compositional methods that are used on Trout Mask Replica, and I hope that it's helped you to understand the music a little bit better.